Welcome to the second part of Lecture 5, Integration Strategies. It's entitled Methods of Integration, Initial Strategies. One of the most important things that we can use in integration is integration by parts, and this is the integral form of what is called the product rule in differentiation. So let's first start with the product rule. And the product rule starts with a function f of x that can be expressed as the product of two functions, u of x and v of x. And the question is, what is the derivative of f? Now we're going to be assuming that both u of x and v of x are differentiable functions themselves, otherwise the manipulations we're going to be discussing won't necessarily all be valid. So as before, whenever you ask to calculate a derivative, what do you do? you introduce the definition of the derivative. So df of x dx is the limit x1 approaches x of f of x1 minus f of x divided by x1 minus x, which now substituting in f in terms of the u's and the v's is the limit x1 approaches x u of x1 v times v of x1 minus u of x times v of x divided by x1 minus x. That's a mouthful. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is a trick. This is a trick that's incredibly useful, and being able to recognize when to do it is something that changes you from a technician to a practitioner, as we were discussing previously. I'm going to be adding zero. And you'll find in many situations, either adding zero or multiplying by one, if you pick the right thing that is equal to zero or the right thing that is equal to one, greatly simplifies what it is that you need to be doing to manipulate things further in a calculation that you're working on. In this case, the term that is equal to zero that we're going to be adding is this term in red, which is equal to u of x times v of x1 with a negative sign plus u of x times v of x1 with a positive sign. So at first you think, okay, so what? But now what we can do is we can regroup the first two terms and we can regroup the second two terms into something that looks much more familiar. So the first two terms become the limit x1 approaches x, u of x1 minus u of x over x1 minus x times v of x1, plus the limit x1 approaches x of u of x times v of x1 minus v of x over x1 minus x. And you should recognize that we now have the derivative of u and the derivative of v appearing in both of these forms. We can immediately take that limit using the definition of the derivative and the fact that u and v are continuous which automatically occurs because we assumed u and v are differentiable. And what we find is df of x dx is du of x dx times v of x plus u of x times dv of x dx. And that is the very familiar product rule that all of you know, love, and are able to use regularly in manipulations. So integration by parts is just the integral form of the product rule. So let's see how that works. If I were to integrate the derivative of f of x with respect to x. We know, of course, from the fundamental theorem of calculus, that'll give us big F of b minus f of a. Substitute in what f is, that will be u of b times v of b minus u of a times v of a, which we write in the shorthand notation u of x v of x with a vertical bar and a subscript of a and a superscript of b. You've seen this notation before. That means that you substitute the b in for x and you subtract the substitution of the a in for x. And that is the way that we evaluate and symbolically note what the result for a definite integral is. Okay, so I've evaluated this one way. This just used the fundamental theorem of calculus and the definition of f. Let's now evaluate it using the product rule. And so the result here is going to be the substitution du of x dx v of x plus u of x dv of x dx, and those both appear as two terms in the integrals. And we can then put this together in the form that is almost the form that you probably recognize it, because what we typically do is we now rearrange and bring one of those integrals onto the other side. And what we find then is that the integral dx du of x dx v of x is equal to u of x v of x evaluated between the limits a and b minus the integral from a to b dx of u of x times dv of x dx, and that's what's called integration by parts. So let's take a look at this a little bit further. It's really an extremely important tool that can be used for solving many different integration problems, and we're going to go through a couple of examples to give you an idea of the kinds of things that 
you can integrate. So here's an integral of x to the n times log of x for n not equal to 1. At first, when you look at this, you might say, eh, there's no way I can integrate that thing. I don't know any, any, I have no idea even how to begin. But if we let du of x dx equal x to the n, and we let v of x equal log x, then the antiderivative of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. That's what we would call u of x. And the derivative of v of x with respect to x is the derivative of the logarithm. Well, that's just 1 over x. So now if I substitute into the product rule on the top for the u and the v using these explicit forms, what we find is the integral dx x to the n log x is equal to x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 times log x, that's the uv term, minus the integral dx of x to the n divided by n plus 1. It was x to the n plus 1, but then it was divided by a power of x from the dv of x dx, so it becomes just x to the n. And of course I can integrate that. That's going to be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared. So I get my final answer, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 log x minus x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared. Now, let's compare it with something that we know. We've already integrated log x previously in the class. So that's the case where n is equal to 0. And we found before it was equal to x log x minus x. If I substitute into the formula in the line above, you'll see when n is equal to 0, indeed you get x log x minus x. So this agrees with what we saw earlier in the class. Okay, there's another technique that is very useful for integrating uh, complicated integrals, and it's based on the chain rule. So once again, the chain rule comes from taking a derivative with respect to a, a function of one variable and with respect to a function of a second variable. So suppose g of u is a differentiable function of u, and u of x is a differentiable function of x, then if I want to calculate the derivative of g of u of x with respect to x, it's equal to the derivative of g with respect respect to u multiplied by the derivative of u with respect to x. And that is called the chain rule, and it's one of the most important results in differential calculus. So what we want to do is look at an example of this. For example, if I had to evaluate the derivative with respect to theta of sine squared theta plus 1 over sine theta, it's much easier to think of this as u equals sine theta, take the derivative with, with respect to sine theta first, and then take the derivative of sine theta with respect to theta. In fact, subconsciously, you're probably doing this if you were given this as a problem to evaluate. But to really be pedantic, uh, I would take the derivative with respect to sine theta of sine squared theta plus 1 over sine theta multiplied by d sine theta d theta. And simplifying that, I would get 2 sine theta minus 1 over sine theta squared multiplied by cosine theta. Okay, now to use this for integration we sort of need what you would call the inverse of the chain rule. And the integral form of this chain rule or the inverse of the chain rule is going to exchange the integration variable from an integral over x to an integral over u. That sounds kind of trivial but what it does is it actually makes it possible to integrate many kinds of integrals that otherwise look very complex and look like you can't integrate them at all. The hard thing to do is to recognize when you have the situation, when it holds, because there's someone over your shoulder telling you, oh, let's use the inverse of the chain rule. You have to keep it in your bag of tricks, you have to think about it, you have to see whether or not that's something that will work if you're asked to evaluate an integral. But the integral form of it is very simple, it's just the integral dx of g of u at of x multiplied by du of x dx is just equal to the integral du of g of u. And as a simple mnemonic to think of this, you can sort of cancel the dx's from the numerator and the denominator of the integral. But that is something that, of course, you should only do if you really understand what it means, which is the meaning that is given by these full equations here. Let's go through two examples of this. The first one is going to be the integral of log x over x. Now, since I know the derivative of log x is 1 over x, it becomes obvious what my choice is going to be here. I'm going to pick u of x is equal to log x, and then I get an integral of du multiplied by u, because log x is equal to u, and 1 over x is du of x dx, and integral du of u, that's simple, u squared over 2. Now I just have to substitute in what u is. u is equal to log of x, so I get 1 half log of x squared. And indeed, if you take the derivative of that, you'll see it's equal to log x over x. What's our second example? 
Our second example, a little more complicated, we're going to have 1 over x log of x. Once again, I can recognize that 1 over x is the derivative of log x, so I'm going to pick u of x is equal to log x again. Then this integral becomes integral du of 1 over u. I know how to do that integral as well, it's just equal to log of u. Substitute in what u is, and I get logarithm of log of x. Now, so this integration by parts and the inverse of the chain rule are two incredibly useful tools to keep and think about whenever you're asked to do integrals because they can greatly simplify the problem for you and in some cases allow you to even perform the integral completely analytically when you're asked to do so.